Carl Emmett. I better let him in. He's virtually, he's been sitting in the room for a bit, um, but he's just virtually arrived. Yep. Hey, Pete, how are you? I'm good, thanks, Paul. Do you want to just, uh, Ben, on your screen, do you just want to minimise the little Teams tile? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. People don't want to look at me. <laughs> we, get, we get two. We get one at the bottom and then one on Ben's one too. So yeah. we get two Peters. Two, too many. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Good to go, Ben. All right. All right, that's cool. All right, thanks, guys. Uh, thanks for those that are, have, um, that are here now. More will come in throughout the session. Um, this is our second last user group, I think, for the year. Normally, we have the last one in November. Um, if the if the community wants another one in December and we can bring it a bit earlier, uh, we, we you know we can probably do that as well. Um, but usually, we just do the, the ten sessions every year. So this will be the second last one, with November being the last. Um, also, keen for more presentation ideas for the last one. We've got have nothing booked at the moment, but um, yeah. So if there's anything anyone wants to present, please just sing out or anything anyone wants to see, um, sing out as well. Um, I'm sure we can find someone to help present that topic. Uh, so just uh, some formal slides to get through. Just uh, acknowledge the uh, country. We wish to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land we are meeting on, the Wajib people of the Nungan Nation. Pay respect to elders past and present. We recognise and respect their cultural heritage, beliefs and relationship with the land, as well as acknowledge the contribution they make to the life of this city and this region. So we don't have to really worry about timing today. Peter's got a hard stop at one o'clock, so we're going to try and cut short a little bit before that. Uh, and also gives everyone else a chance to get back to work because uh, we know everyone wants to work. Um, just a quick FYI, uh, Peter is recording this session and we'll share the link out afterwards uh, through the Dynamics user group and the LinkedIn. Um, beware. Yeah, if you've got any suggestions, ideas um, around the platform, um, please by all means log those ideas they do that are being listened to now. So. Uh, I know I mention this every session, but it is important. The agenda for today. So we have the uh, lovely Peter Schmidt from Microsoft, our very own, uh, just running through some more Dynamics 365. And if we've got time to Power Platform, October 2020 uh, release wave updates. And then I've put, uh, put my hand up finally to do a presentation. And I'm going to be running through the Flow UI and in particular the new Power Automate desktop that's currently in preview. So it's, um, that's just to give you us, uh, it's only spent a few days on this, but it's um, quite easy to use and uh, I'm pretty sure you guys will be as thoroughly as impressed as I was. So without further ado, uh, over to you, Peter. Okay, I will start sharing my screen. Okay, so um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, oh, hang on, try sharing the screen again. Um, so this afternoon, I'm going to give you a whistle-stop tour of uh, the features that were in the um, October wave release. Um, there was more than 600 pages of documentation um, of new features. Um, obviously, I can't go through all of those, but I um, will focus on the big ticket items. Um, I think this release, and, and in fact, the releases this year um, have been interesting because over the last few years, there's been a huge amount of work done on re, you know, creating the common data service and uh, re, -platform, re platforming the solution onto that, um, but also the unified client interface as well. And, and I guess the thing with this release is they're really sort of polishing the product now. And as Ben mentioned, the idea site is becoming increasingly important because the product groups are actively going through the backlog of user requests and enhancements. Um, and working on that now. So there's lots of lots and lots of little tweaks, but there's also a few big ticket items. Um, the other thing to say is that um, whilst the October release is barely out the door, the product group teams have pretty much completed the April release. So they have to check in their code before Christmas so that it can start all the testing in the new year. And I know um, whilst I don't have any details as to what's coming, I think if you look at the stuff that's been put into the um, October wave release, you might get a few hints of where the product's going. And, and and James Phillips, who heads up the dev team, was super excited about what's coming in April. He said there's some just amazing technology um, that's coming to the platform. OK, um, I'm going to rattle through these slides quick. I, I will share the deck or I have shared the, the deck with Ben, um, so I'm not going to go through the detail on the slides. It's, it's really just going to be very, very quick show and tell. 
Um, so I wanted to start with customer insights. Customer insights is probably the fastest growing product of the Dynamics apps. And it's really, uh, for those of you who haven't heard of it, it's our customer data platform tool um, that lets you effectively amalgamate um, data um, from multiple systems um, to create a, a single view of customer. And then it has a whole heap of out of the box analytics and dashboards to um, uh, create these customer 360 views. Um, and so you can use it completely independently of Dynamics. It doesn't need the CRM piece, but obviously if you have the CRM, then any of these um, widgets of dashboard or whatever can be included um, in your Dynamics records. Um, but uh, uh, also it's a tool that if you are just starting a customer on their Dynamics journey, um, most customers I speak to have lots of customer data in different systems. So it's a really great way of actually cleaning up their data and, and getting it in the right format to import it into Dynamics. Okay, so the, um, uh, the features that have been added is that there is far more um, uh, analytics available in it and we're able to pull in more data now. So the, the most obvious one is from customer voice, um, but we also, are bringing in additional data. So you may have heard or seen a product that we were um, previewing at the start of this year called Product Insights um, and Market Insights. Um, it looks like some of those are going to get rolled into um, Customer Insights as well. So we have data from being about what people are searching on um, and what links they're clicking on when they go to websites. They're looking to enrich um, customer data with um, those insights as well. Um, the next one is um, more security one. So obviously we, we have, um, we're very aware of GDPR and the other um, privacy regulations. So there's just more um, so security controls in it. Um, and also um, health, the HIPAA um, security um, endorsement is in there as well. Okay. Um, one of the uses of customer insights as well is it automatically will suggest um, marketing segments. Um, and so it will look for patterns um, uh, between the different customers um, and actually suggest segments for you. So that's a kind of a good lead into the Dynamics Marketing app, which is um, the first thing is that we can pull in those segments from customer insights. Um, and these can be uh, dynamic segments. So, um, the idea with customer insights is it will run um, periodically, um, create new insights, and if some of those new insights have um, actions attached to them, such as a customer, you know, falling into a, a, a marketing segment, um, then that will get passed across into Dynamics um, for a marketing campaign. Um, so one of the themes you will see is the amount of AI that's getting added to the product now. Um, and marketing is one of the first um, bits that's getting some of this. So, you know, at the moment when you create a segment, you're effectively building a query um, to find the, 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 the customers that you want to target. Um, with the natural language now, you can type in a, a sentence like, you know, I want people who have a birthday this month and work in finance, for example, and it will automatically generate that query for you. Um, so they're taking some of the sort of natural language stuff that's been developed in Power BI and, 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 and I guess leveraging some of that IP now in the product. But certainly as a, a business user that's not used to creating queries, this will provide a much nicer um, user interface for doing that. The other thing is that um, Dynamics Marketing has the ability to manage events. Obviously with the COVID situation, more and more of these have been virtual events happening online. Um, previously, you had to use a third party on 24 for, for live events. Um, you can now use Microsoft Teams. Uh, the other thing that's had a bit of a makeover is the customer journey designer. So they've, um, based on sort of usability and user feedback, they've gone through um, and actually tweaked the design of that um, um, to make, I, I guess, it a bit, a bit more productive and easier to use. Um, 
this is just a personal opinion. I, I think they might be sort of trialing this because I, I don't like the process flow designer and I'm hoping that um, this will um, transition across to that as well, um, uh, just to make it a bit easier to use. So you can, for example, rather than going horizontally, you can view a journey vertically if that's what you want to do. Um, you can also um, create rich social media content now. So Facebook, Twitter and LinkedIn. Um, so that's just another, uh, and you can schedule um, when those articles get posted. And then also you have marketing forms now. So if you want to collect information um, from people, then um, you've had that capability before, but previously you could only capture against a lead or a contact entity. Now you can um, uh, connect the form to custom entities as well. Um, and then also the actual designer for your emails and your forms been tweaked. Uh, again, just to make it a bit uh, quicker and easier um, to uh, create and edit these. And so, for example, you can edit marketing forms within events or you can um, go into the customer journey and go straight into the editors from that. Um, likewise, the, the email editor has also been enhanced. Um, there's, I guess there's a theme you'll see later on. We've done something with the email editor as well for, for customer service. So um, a lot of these you used to spawn, you know, more forms or you had to do quite a few clicks to get to these parts. Um, what they've done with this release is you've either got pop up forms or just uh, much far fewer clicks to get to those particular editors. Um, if we look at sales and sales insights, um, I'll talk a bit more about the telephony piece when I come to customer service, but we do have integration with Teams now. And I'll talk about the other one. So, um, conversation intelligence is where effectively the system is listening in on a phone call. And so, it's actually listening for um, the sentiment or for particular actions or listen for competitors names and so on. So that will um, automatically create the transcript of the call, but also um, it may even create actions for you um, to follow up on. The actual screen interface here is one that so Microsoft use dynamics internally and we have a very large internal sales team. Um, if you think of the consumer business with Xbox and Surface and all the rest of it. So um, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with this design, but effectively um, for people in a contact center, you don't want to be going back to your list view all the time. And so on the left hand side here, you've got a column and that's your, your uh, list of actions. Um, and uh, the, they're sort of ranked according to importance or propensity to buy in this case. Um, and so basically, as I go through that list, once as I knock off each call, you know, they, they bubble, um, the next one comes up the list. So it's a, just a much more efficient way of dealing with lots of calls. Um, there's also been some enhancements to forecasting as well. So forecasting was is a fairly new or, um, component in um, dynamic sales. Um, so based on the feedback from the April release, there's been um, some enhancements to that as well. Um, again, AI is a theme that's running through the product. So um, they've provided the ability to um, sort of fine tune the lead and opportunity scoring um, in, in more detail. There's also a new mobile app. Um, and there's also, we'll come to field service in a bit, there's a new mobile app for field service as well. Now, underneath the, the hood, they're actually using power, power apps, but um, at the moment, they are not an editable power app. So you don't see that it's a power app. It's the, the power app engine is embedded in the, in, in the app itself. Um, but uh, what's nice is it, because Microsoft are using these, these tools now, it, it's driving some nice enhancements to the power platform as well now. So you've got things we've been asked for for a while, like being able to dictate notes directly um, into uh, the, 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 the contact record, for example. 
Um, another thing that's been asked for a lot is just make it easy to create um, PDF documents as well. Just going to skip on to that in the interest of time. Uh, the other enhanced experience, um, as I mentioned earlier, is, is the ability or the email editor. So um, there's a new email form um, that makes it easier to put things like attachments in it. Um, you can have inline file attachments. Um, you, you've had inline images for a while now, but um, the customers locally that have been trialing this, they've, they, they've really liked it and said, it's made them um, or their contact center agents much more productive because they're, they're able to um, generate the email much quicker. So you can see you can do things like reply all and forward and things like that directly um, in the screen now. And so you, you get the email come up as a pop up. OK, in the interest of time, I will move on. Um, the other enhancement that's been done is around um, the duplicate detection and how you merge records uh, as well. So um, there is a new interface that um, helps you um, yeah, basically decide what to do with potential duplicates and, and, and manage those for you. If I move on to uh, Dynamics customer service, this, uh, I guess the biggest announcement, and this is probably one of the, the most significant uh, announcements for the platform is the integration of Azure Communication Services. Now, Azure Communication Services is actually the service that underpins Microsoft Teams. So when you're sending you know, messages, when you're making phone calls, when you're making video calls, that's all using Azure Communication Services. And so it's, a, it's not a new technology. Obviously, it's been pretty hard and tested over the last nine months, given the, the, the growth in Teams. Um, but effectively, what they've done is, is, is um, decouple it from Teams and so that we can embed um, ACS directly in Dynamics now. Um, and so what that means is, you know, you can take your phone number um, and move to, to Azure Communication Services and make your phone calls and receive your phone calls all via that. Um, so effectively, you know, currently, we, if, if customers are using a, a contact center systems like um, Avaya or Genesis or Cisco or whatever, um, you know, we have to integrate to that call center, that contact center system. Um, effectively, with ACS, we can bypass that because calls come straight into Dynamics. Um, and that makes things a lot easier um, because we when you're creating things like routing rules and measuring time on hold and things like that, um, you only have to create those once in Dynamics. Um, currently, um, you know, you have to set up the rules in your call center system and set them up in Dynamics. Um, so that will greatly simplify things. But as we've seen earlier, um, we can do things like live transcripts of the phone conversation um, we can record that phone conversation. Um, and uh, yeah, I think this, this is the real game changer for Dynamics because we actually have all of our channels now coming into um, Dynamics directly rather than having to integrate to third party systems. Um, and then it can also be used for outbound messages and SMSs and things like that. So currently you have to use a gateway provider for SMSs like Twilio. Um, you'll be able to um, do it directly from Dynamics now using ACS. Um, and then the other thing that's happened is we did have multiple different interfaces for um, contact center agents. So, you know, you had Unified Service Desk, you had Customer Service Hub, um, you had Omnichannel Engagement Hub. Um, 
effectively now for if you're online we have what's called customer service workspace and this is the the, the one interface to all them all so effectively customer service workspace will let you deal with multiple um, cases at the same time so you it creates the tabs uh, across the top of the screen there and then as you uh, turn on or enable additional channels then they all become available uh, in here as well so um, you don't have separate um, interfaces whether you're using omnichannel engagement or customer service hub there is just one interface now um, and I guess the uh, for those customers that are using unified service desk um, you know, ultimately, we, we, we're looking to get everybody using using this now, um, uh, accepting that there are sometimes still good reasons why you need unified service desk for integration to on-prem systems. Um, but we're trying to trying to get everybody to move online if we can. Um, there's been quite a bit of work done around knowledge base, um, so. Um, in fact, knowledge base and search, you may have seen uh, on my LinkedIn post, the new relevant search or Azure search experience. There's a lot of work being done across Microsoft on search. Um, and um, so doing using more AI to, to, to try and find the right answers for you. So you'll see with knowledge base, it's actually, um, it was always pretty good, but it's, it's, it's improved it significantly in trying to provide the contact center agents with the right articles. But there's also now some, some modern um, analytics and modern dashboards as well around knowledge search. Um, and that's an area Microsoft are still uh, investing in um, to improve that even further. Um, so that's that, that that just talks, this screenshot is just related to what I've just said, where um, the smart assist is uh, a knowledge search is um, making recommendations for you. And that sort of smart assist feature as well is all about um, next best action. Um, so it will, you know, obviously prompt the user to um, uh, with some with some recommendations um, and also kind of guide them step by step through um, a conversation as well. Um, now, this is a, a really, really cool feature as well. Um, that one of my colleagues has put a, a video up on YouTube showing this, but um, you may have seen previously with Azure Bot Service um, the ability for you to start interacting with the bot via any language and have it automatically translated. Well, that feature is now in Dynamics itself. And so what happens is if I, um, as a customer, type a message in French, um, what the agent will see is the French version and then the English translation version. The agent, the, the agent can reply in English and it will be translated back to French again. Now, if the customer, for whatever reason, changes language, this, again, the system will detect it and just um, swap the language. Um, but uh, um, this, is, this is super cool for, well, particularly Australia, where we've got multicultural society. People can interact in their own language if they want to, but also some of my global customers that have to support um, Spanish and things like that. Uh, so moving on, um, field service. Um, again, field service is, is kind of getting to a, a pretty good level of maturity now. So they're, they're working their way, uh, I guess, through the backlog. But one of the things that often comes up is, um, um, and particularly in, in WA, I would say, is that when field service was developed originally, the kind of, um, I guess, scenario they had in mind was, the sort of man in a van going out to fix washing machines and fridges and things like that. So it was where you're you know, going out and doing work at customers' houses. Um, but over over here, we often use it um, for managing work orders on mine sites and factories and, and things like that. So um, an address is not really good enough there um, because obviously these are big sites. You, you actually need to know where the asset is on that site. And so one of the things that's been added is this asset hierarchy now. So you can get much more prescriptive as to, you know, this is on the third floor in such and such a room. And then also 
with the asset itself, that can have a, a hierarchy. So if I've got an air conditioning unit um, that needs repairing and I go in and replace the condenser in it, for example, then that's a, a component that's part of that asset as well. So that's something that people have been asking for and is, is, is now in the system. The, the other thing to keep an eye out for is the Azure Maps team have been doing a lot of work around mapping buildings and mapping interiors. Um, and so you can actually sort of take a floor plan of a, of a building and actually have that created as a map now. So I, I think, and again, I don't know this, but I, I think some of that will find its way into Dynamics as well um, soon. So you can actually not just say turn up at this address, but here's the, the optimal route to get to the building and, and the place where the asset actually is that needs to be repaired. Um, again, there's some um, usability enhancements now. So for, for those of you that have used field service, um, you may have become aware that often you have to click through multiple screens to, to actually create work orders and, and do particular tasks. Um, now they actually um, perform as pop-ups. So um, you don't lose your context once you've done that particular piece, you continue um, in the parent record um, underneath. Um, so that will um, certainly enhance usability and productivity. We've also got um, close integration with uh, Dynamics 365 uh, Finance or the supply chain management um, component of that as well. Um, so again, if you have a, uh, a technician out somewhere, they, they need to order a part or check stock, they're able to do that um, much more easily now. Um, now, there is a new look um, resource scheduling board. And in fact, um, I think come April, they probably will retire the existing scheduling board. So this is, um, I think, is a, is a lot cleaner. Um, you're able to get more information on the screen. But in terms of actual functionality, they've also enhanced the automated scheduling optimization. So resource scheduling optimization, ISO, has always been part of it, but they've just made it even easier to go in and um, uh, uh, to, to automatically schedule a particular individual work order. Um, um, the other thing they've done is, again, I, I mentioned about Azure Maps and Bing Maps. So we're, we're getting some of the features that, um, if those of you use Google Maps for your, for your car journeys and things like that. We, are, we, are, we do actually get live traffic feeds now coming into that. So we can um, predict travel time. Um, so that's been added to your work orders. Um, the other thing is that, uh, again, the, in the, uh, occasionally when you, you're using Dynamics, you occasionally get thrown back to some of the old screens, the old original Dynamics screens. And one of those was when you were entering staff availability, their working hours, that finally has now been moved on to UCI. So it, it has that modern look and feel. And then we have this new um, field service mobile app. Um, so as most of you are aware, um, field service did have its own sort of dedicated mobile app that was built on some technology that Microsoft licensed from Resco. Um, the intention is that by April, um, the Dynamics Field Service mobile app, the new one, um, will have uh, all that functionality in it. It has most of the functionality now, and, and so some customers are already using this one. Um, but uh, yeah, the intention is um, it will have everything that the old app, um, mobile app had, plus, plus more. Um, coming to it come April. And as I also mentioned, whilst this is built on the Power Platform, Power Apps, um, it is actually a, a self-contained app, so you can't go in and edit it with a Power App editor or anything like that at the moment. Um, the other common thing that customers wanted was being able to track where 
um, a technician was in real time. So if I'm waiting at home for somebody to come around to, to fix something, it, it was a nice customer experience if I could look up to see where they were. A bit like um, you know, if you're using Uber, being able to know where your driver is at the moment. Um, and historically, we had to use a third party tool like Glimpse to provide that functionality. Um, field service now has that functionality built into it. So um, the customer can click on a link, it will take them to a map and, and show them in real time um, where that person is. The other thing that um, was added was an inspection functionality. Now, um, Originally, we were, well, I guess a few people have said, why, why didn't you use Forms Pro or, or Customer Voice as it is now? But um, it didn't really work for field service because one of the things you wanted to do was, was work offline with it. And um, uh, Customer Voice wasn't really architected to work that way. So you, you have the same kind of user experience for going in and creating the, the survey questions and the branching logic and so on. Clearly, in this case, you wouldn't have questions like um, the customer satisfaction type um, questions, um, but it, it, this provides a really nice way of, of creating within field service this survey or inspection app um, rather than having to build a, a custom power app, which is what um, other customers have done. Um, and then also there's a new um, Power BI based dashboard for field service. Um, again, it's actually a, a hard-coded one, so at the moment customers can't go in and edit it, but I guess that's one of the themes you'll see running through the product now is, is, is more and more integration with Power BI. Um, I, I wonder how long the existing um, sort of dashboard functionality within the product will remain. Microsoft haven't made any announcements on that yet, but Power BI offers such a, a, a much nicer visually and a much richer interactive experience. And so, um, yeah, I think more and more customers will just flip over and use Power BI in future. Um, and then the other thing we've done is there's a little bit more granularity when you're capturing work order execution. So um, if you want to, sometimes like a, a customer or technician might arrive at a mine site but it then may take them 15 minutes to actually get to the bit of equipment that they need to repair. Um, and so what, what we're able to do now is actually, you know, track at a more granular level when they actually started work on the job and when they finished. So you actually get analytics on how long the actual job took, um, excluding the, the actual travel once you're on site to get there, if that makes sense. Um, and then also the customer voice, um, integration. So once you finish a job, um, it will automatically send them a customer voice survey. Um, we have the same thing with um, uh, customer service when you close cases, for example. Um, just mention it very briefly as well. Um, Dynamics Project Operations has gone into um, uh, uh, general availability now. It kind of straddles some of the finance and operations and the old project service automation features. Um, probably at some point we should have a session just on the new project operations. So I've just put a couple of slides in that just really cover off the sort of functionality that's in there, but it's probably a topic for another day. So I'll probably just take a couple of minutes longer just to cover off some of the Power Platform stuff very quickly, if that's okay, Ben. Um, I know Lisa Crosby did a session um, uh, recently on some of the new stuff, so I'm not going to repeat what Lisa said, but other than just highlight a few things to you. So um, there's a lot of work going in to, to promote the Power Platform um, to professional developers as well. Um, whilst we originally kind of pitched it as a citizen developer tool, we're seeing more and more um, dev teams actually using it now. And so things like, you know, being able to create apps um, in Azure, being able to use API management now, um, being able to integrate with GitHub. And so you can do um, proper um, software development lifecycle stuff using GitHub. Um, and then also, 
yeah, we've seen here the, the CICD capability as well for management of deployment of apps through to different environments and so on. Um, I won't steal Ben Thunder. He's going to take us through the Power Automate desktop. Um, the only thing I will say here was we had a call with Charles Lamana last week. He was super excited about this. He, he was saying that robotic process automation, he thinks, is a bigger opportunity than Power Apps because there are so many mundane, routine things that users do on their desktop. Um, that could be automated using RPA um, on their desktop. And there's so many processes in a, in a business that could be automated with the Power Automate in general. Um, that whole digital process automation and robotic process automation, he thinks is a huge, huge market. So something to get into. Um, Two other things finally. Um, so Power Virtual Agents, there's been some work uh, or a lot of work being done with them. Um, and so we mentioned previously, I think Lisa mentioned about um, Project Oakdale. So being able to create Power Apps and deploy Power Apps directly within Teams. And it's actually, uh, that's actually free. If, you, if you're licensed for Teams, you can build Power Apps off of the Project Oakdale database. Um, uh, included with your team's license. It's the same thing with Power Virtual Agents. So a lot of people when COVID happened were building internal bots um, for answering HR questions and things like that. So you can now build and deploy Power Virtual Agents in Teams for free. Um, I guess the only cost that you may incur is if you need to integrate um, the PVA bot to a backend system using Power Automate, um, then if you're looking up information, for example, in an HR system, you're probably going to need a premium connector to do that. But you can use enterprise flow licenses to do that quite cheaply. So you don't have to license individual users. You just um, uh, license the flows that do that connection. And what else was there? You, they've also been, there's also been uh, a lot of work to bring more of the Azure bot framework stuff into Power Virtual Agents. Um, and so you can do some quite sophisticated skills now um, with uh, that integration. And there's more and more of that stuff coming through to PVA. So, um, you know, I talked about what we're doing with telephony and so on. It's not going to be too long before you may be able to have a PVA bot actually answer a phone call and talk to the user um, and uh, and deal with their questions um, using voice. Um, and the user may not even be aware that they're actually talking to a bot rather than a real person. So I, I think that um, uh, whilst I'm not, um, I don't know, but I think joining, reading the tea leaves and joining the bits of the announcements together um, at Ignite and, and, and with what's happened recently, I think that's something that is very, very close um, to being a reality. Um, and then the final thing is um, Power BI is also getting uh, pushed out through Teams as well. So Teams has really become people's new um, Windows desktop, um, for lack of a better way of putting it. So uh, a lot of people, you know, go into Teams, they spend most of their day in Teams. So it, it makes sense to bring the apps and bring the data to where the users are. And so we have all of that integration now. So look, I think um, looking at the time, I'd better hand over to Ben to carry on. Um, and uh, hopefully we have a few minutes for Q&A at the end as well. Over to you, Ben. Thanks, Peter. Um, all right, so I think we've got enough time. It should be fine. Um, haven't done any timings, but let's give it a go. So I'm just gonna just do a quick uh, intro for those who don't know too much about UIFlow. Um, so what is UIFlow? It's, I guess it's Microsoft's fairly new Power Platform robotic process automation tool. I guess you could, you know, what is a robotic process automation tool? Really, it comes down to the ability to automate common business process tasks with software. So just instructing either a web browser to do something or uh, an old piece of software where there's no API available to go do things without a human is kind of where this is aimed at. Um, so there's an example here, for example, when, you know, we scan an image, we see it appears maybe in an online folder somewhere. 
either via flow or manually by a person. Um, the RPA process can kick in. It could then log into an old finance system and enter in that receipt rather than having um, a receptionist or a finance person do that work. So um, that's kind of where this thing's sort of aimed at. Um, the other thing I'm interested in personally is just around testing of software. I'm in the game of, and I'm sure a lot of us are, around the building of software and looking at maybe use cases around how we could use this tool to test our software. So that's something I'll be looking into in the coming months. Um, and I, I can come back into a second presentation and see how I go on that side. Um, so when to use UI flow. So obviously there's the existing type of flows we know today. Um, so our normal automated flows where we, we can log into flow.microsoft.com, we can design up a flow, drag and drop, our, um, you know, choose a trigger and select our actions. And that's all been designed in the web. And you can either automate them, you can make them manual, you can schedule those. Um, there is the other flow type called the business process flow, which is from the older uh, Dynamics business process flow days. Where this new UI flow, um, you use it more when you don't have an API um, and you need to integrate or control an existing older piece of software, or you want to use it for web applications, driving web applications where you need to log in and do something or perform a task. Um, however, if you do have an API available, I probably recommend that you stay with using the normal flow, um, like for example, a developer. But I guess this is more of an end user type thing where you don't have the skill set to integrate with an API. Um, however, even from a developer's point of view, maybe you could use this as well um, in terms of using your flow controlling another website. But definitely for old applications, no APIs available, definitely look at the UI flow stuff. If there's the API available, um, get a developer to do it. If not, if there's no developer available, then you can go and use the UIflow as well. It's, it's not entirely up to you. Um, so one of the things I learned with the preview when I was running through this is now the new Power Automate option. So before UIflows has been around for a little while, before we had the Windows Recorder and the Selenium IDE method of performing these automated tasks, but now we've introduced this new Power Automate desktop. Um, which you may be asking what that is. So. Um, I'll get I'll get into that in a minute. I've just done a little bit of an architecture on how that works. So there's two types of uh, um, automation with this UI flow. Uh, you've got the attended version. So that's where you need to have a user sitting at your machine, um, obviously licensed for the attended license, and they um, have to, I guess, they don't necessarily have to trigger the process, but they have to be logged in, and the desktop application has to be running. And then we'll have a look at that in the demo. Um, the other option which has caught my attention was the unattended version. So that's where you can not have someone log in. You can set up 10 servers to install the Power Automate desktop and obviously the data gateway. You can actually instruct 10 servers to go and uh, perform a task all at the same time. So if, you know, maybe a bad example is like a voting system, maybe you want 10 bots to go and place a lot of votes for a president, maybe. <laughs> Who knows? Um, from my perspective, from a developer point of view, it, this actually could be used for like a, a mass load test, for example. We could instruct it to upload some file into some software, which might go do some heavy work, and it might be a, way, a simple way to go and um, do this 10 times, for example. So with those two types of methods of the robotic process automation, this is where the licensing kicks in. So you license it either via the attended or the unattended method. What I have up on the screen at the moment is RRP US pricing. Um, if you guys are interested in looking at, you know, purchasing this, and um, you can get a trial first, but when you go to purchase it, talk to Peter, he might be able to do your deal. Um, we did notice a small issue on the website this morning, although I didn't see it the second time, Paul, um, where there was slightly different pricing on different pages for the unattended RPA add-on. So you can see the unattended is quite a bit more expensive and it's based on per bot. So I'm assuming that's per bot per machine um, that you might be running that on. So as opposed to a per user. So there's your pricing and licensing and how that gets covered off. The other thing you get when you get the license is because Microsoft purchased Win Automation, you actually get their tool as well. And what I'm sensing is their re, their, this, this powered desktop automate application is actually Microsoft's version of this Win Automation tool. There was another screen that I saw on the internet where the UIs are very similar. Um, so I have a feeling what they're going to be doing here. And Peter, correct me if, correct me if I'm did, wrong. They, they just reskinned it for now to get it out. Yeah, there. yeah. So I think you've got the old version and you, you've got the Win Automation version and you get the new Microsoft version. So um, I'm assuming, you know, come feature parity time, they'll probably get rid of this one. Um, 
Um, yeah, I'm not too sure. That's just my assumption. Okay, one thing to be careful of, um, just because, say if you went down the unattended automation route, say if you had Word or Excel on a server and you wanted to automate a task, maybe to do, do some finance job, you still have to have that Excel or Word or Office licensed or any other software for that matter. So if you're, if you're automatically logging into SAP, for example, um, you will still probably need a user cow or an unattended license to perform that function. And that, and this caught my eye the other day. I was like, why, why are we starting to see Office E3 unattended licenses? And then it clicked when I was looking into this. Obviously, if you're doing some sort of function automatically unattended, um, with Office, for example, you need to make sure that Office is licensed with the unattended license. Um, otherwise, you'd be in violation of those licenses. So that, that was one that um, I wasn't aware of. Let's be careful of that. Um, I've done a bit of a architecture diagram here. Just to walk you through what I'm going to show today as well. So what we have up on the top here um, is just your standard power platform. One thing you do need is a CDS instance. So when I fired up a trial, it wouldn't actually let me do a UI flow at all without a CDS instance provision. So I don't know why that's there. Maybe it's storing some of the data, like test run data in there, I'm not sure. But I didn't have to do anything other than create that um, besides selecting. It might be storing the flows against it. Um, what I'm going to be showing today is actually uh, a flow that I've already created, just given the time we've got, um, and a process where I've got a standard flow calling a UI flow that actually triggers the same, same sort of UI flow down here on my desktop. Power Automate desktop that's installed um, will actually perform a function. I'm only going to do a web browser one today. I haven't had time to look into like a, a Windows legacy application yet. But for that automation to work, that trigger to work, you'd need to install the on-premise data gateway. Um, at first, I thought you might be able to get away with just installing this desktop application, but you also need to install the on-premise data gateway. So the way the communication works is, is when this flow is triggered, it talks to the registration at the top of that gateway, it will come down. This will sense by reaching out, so you don't need to punch a hole in your firewall. This actually reaches out and detects it, and then we'll kick off the UI flow within here, and then away it goes. It goes and does what it needs to do and then returns the result. And you can monitor it all up within the flow Microsoft.com platform as well. Um, this little area here, I've just put in there to say, when you author your UI flows, you can't do it, from what I can tell, in the web interface. You have to have this installed to author your new UI flow with the Power Automate desktop. Um, and then when you hit save, it actually saves it directly up to there. So through your standard uh, internet connection. So one other thing that was interesting is just checking the cluster approach. So you can have the same flow with multiple gateways on servers installed. And now one thing I'm not too sure of is if you need a separate gateway on every server or you could get away with one gateway on the same domain or network um, or Azure network. But um, if you've got firewalls in the way, I'd say you, the easiest thing to do is probably just to put one on each one. And you can just join it to the existing cluster at the top and you can install Power Automate on each of these machines when you're going to start this flow, um, I won't show this today, but I do see a screen where you can manage the various um, options uh, or monitor, monitor which ones are failing, which ones are working and how the performance is going. So that was quite interesting. So I think there's a there's a lot of growth that's going to happen around this area. Um, so I'm just going to do a quick demo. Um, mine was a very simple requirement. So I'll just, I'm just going to show you where, where a simple email, I'll send a simple email and then I want the Power Automate to pick that up and actually execute my robotic UI flow that's just going to test the login for Dynamics, make sure that login still works. Um, I did go a little bit further in my, in my process, but that's just kind of a scenario that we're working with. Um, all right, so what I'll do now is I'll just click over to the actual UI flow. So what I've got here, this is your normal area where you run your flows and go new flow. And one of the new things you've got here is UI flow, or you can click it here. So you can see the new wave sort of notification kicking in. So you can click on edit here and it's going to force you can't edit on the web, you've got to go launch the app. So I'll click on launch the app so on my desktop. And so for this bit to work, you need to have the browser extension working. You can't have an application or a website just launch an application on your machine. So that's why you've got to install the extension. Um, let's see if that's come up. I already had it open, so let's just jump across to here. So I've already done, I've already started a new one um, just to sort of speed this up. So my scenario was, is I wanted to read, a, uh, log into Dynamics, but for that, for this scenario, I wanted to read a password from Excel. So I've got this uh, subflow called read password. 
what I'm doing is I, I'm getting it to launch Excel, and it was quite easy for me to do this. I didn't need to do the recording method, which you can do here. You get a lot of helper little things on the side where, for example, where's my Excel one? I saw the second thing. So you can go launch it, you can drag and drop, so you just drag this over, and there's double click this, so you've got some settings. So I've actually not specified a static file name, I've made a, a value, um, and I wanted to read the value in the spreadsheet, which is an encrypted password. So if someone norm, someone who got access to this spreadsheet opened it up, they'll just see a bunch of the encrypted text. I'll then decrypt it with a, another special password. So it's a bit of a dodgy scenario, but I just want to sort of show you the concept. I'll then store that password, well, this password will be then stored in the output of this step. And then I close the Excel down. And then going back to the main, the next thing it's going to do is do a login and log into Dynamics. I've got my password, I've statically set my camera. Now to get these steps, I use the recorder. So I click on web recorder. I might just do a quick thing there, I can cancel it. Um, so you, you can choose one of these four browsers, click on next. It loads up the browser, so you can prepare what you need to do. So you might want to go to, you know, Dynamics or Power Platform or some other thing you're testing, and then you can click Start Recording. As you, from that point forward, so I'll just do it now. Let's see. Okay. <laughs> so you hit Start Recording. You start recording, and we might want to do a simple search, and you'll get this little red thing, and it's just trying to find the IDs or the items that you're, if, if you need to perform the action on. So I might just go. Um, then I can go stop or pause. I can change things out. So I was doing this a lot. I recorded it. I did a few recordings um, already and I made some mistakes, went back and I injected it. And so I can go finish, but I'm not going to do that. It will inject, it will actually add those steps into right here. Um, so I slowly went through and I navigated through the logging process for just getting into dynamics. Um, and I got it to put in various usernames. I got the encrypted text for the password. I've set that one in there. Um, and I, and then it goes through and does the login. So that's what it does. And then one thing I did on top of that is to navigate around a little bit and populate some fields. I was, I was, hope, I was hoping to um, go to field service, go to an account, create a new one, enter some data and hit save. I had an issue. I'll still show that anyway. Um, yeah, so, and that's kind of, and that, that was it really. So you, you, can, you can run it at any time. So locally on my machine, I can, and I'll do that now actually, just to show you. So I hope it doesn't stuff anything up. So I'm going to go run. What I expected to do, you won't probably see it quickly. It's really quick actually. It'll open up Excel. It'll pull out the value. So it's done that now. It's got the password. Now it's going to fire up my edge, hopefully. Go to the login. And the login is always the tricky part with automated testing. Um, so you can go through it, put in my password from Excel. It's going to the trial version of Dynamics. Um, I've put a wait in here, but I, what I should have done is actually got it to click on field service. But depending on the screen orientation, it can change. So I've just done a you know, redirect to field service. And I've gone through here and filled out the fields. But one error that I've issue that I've got is that data entry is not going in properly. I put my mouse over and it's disappearing. So I don't know what's happening there. That's for me to figure out. And um, I'll give you guys an update a bit later on what's happened there. But it was it was stopping me from saving and closing automatically. It kept coming up with this error. So that was an interesting one. I don't know. I don't know. It might be a specific way Dynamics text fields are set up. I might not do it on other website. I doubt it will do it on other websites. Um, so there's me manually running that sort of robotic process as an attended person. Um, so if I go to back to history to simply change it back to um oops sorry I think where is it there's a screen that allows me to change it to might be in the power to make this top yeah there's a there's a setting in it might be over this side so I'll just um focus jumping around and editing there's a, there's a place to actually change it from attended to unattended, but when I did that, um, I didn't have the correct license. So obviously with the trial, and I couldn't figure out how to get a trial of the unattended uh, license, so I can get it to work. Um, but what I will do right now, and then we'll wrap it up, is I'm just going to perform my full flow. So if I just go back to uh, this, uh, I've got another flow where it runs the whole, it runs the whole receive an email, execute, um, I think it's here. A normal automate flow, 
that's going to detect an email. Then it's going to run my flow that I've built with the Power Automate preview. And I think it, yeah, it was here, sorry. So this is where you set the unattended attended, but I couldn't set it to unattended here. I didn't like it. Um, and then if that's successful, it will send an email back to me. Um, so I'm going to do that now. So everything should be okay. I'm going to say that. I've got an example outlook somewhere here. Yeah. You can see our previous run, so that's the, the result. Let's just do it again. Works. So I'm just going to email. So anyone right now can email this address and it will kick off. Um, it's looking for run UI flow number one. So it's a bit of a bad use case, but it just shows the power of the power automate. Um, could be doesn't have to be triggered by email. We know that the heaps of connectors uh, could be triggered by a DevOps process or could be um, configured by some user action somewhere. So now that I've seen that this email has come in, I should actually see my machine take over and it does take a few seconds for it to kick in. Um, there we go. So the local, what's happened there is that the flow online the automate process is talking through my data gateway I've got installed locally on my laptop and telling the Power Automate to run that test, uh, which I ran manually just a second ago. And if that all succeeds correctly, so I did have it trying to save that account and it was failing, so I would never get that third email. Um, so I'll just remove no waiting for that. What I should actually see once I've clicked that, I should better jump to my other monitor here and see the last run. It actually refreshed say a minute ago or something. Anyway. So, and you can see the run history, you can go in here. You can see, what I was impressed with is you can actually see the steps of the UI flow here. So you can see it's gone, uh, not this one, so long, but, uh, still getting used to all the different areas. Here we go. So you can see there's the main flow that I created. It's kicking in, it's actually running through, it's showing you the steps of that flow there. Even though you can't edit it within the web, you can actually see the steps. And if something fails, you can see uh, you can see I've got a step at step, full service create account, blah, 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 it's going through. Um, and if I go back to Outlook, you can actually see a new email come in saying, blow your test around successfully because that whole how thing works. Good job. So there's a, given the time, I'll probably need to wrap it up. Um, there's your flow UI, uh, very quick intro. I hope that makes sense. And um, yeah, any questions, guys, even either for this session or for Peter's session? Peter's got one minute and needs to shoot. Yeah, it looks awesome. <laughs> one thing I'll just comment, Ben. Is the, the, the thing that the, um, the, the, the new desktop client gives you is it, it understands lots of apps. So like Excel, you, know, you see the functions in yes. there, like um, find the next free column and stuff like that. It's more than just yeah. recording the screen. It actually has you know, deep integration. Exactly, yeah. It has the same sort of thing with SAP as well as an example. Yeah, one thing I was interested in uh, was, was you've got some Active Directory, you can create users, you've got OCR stuff um, and other other things you can do. What's another one that I was impressed with? You can connect to databases, file systems, there's a whole bunch of other stuff. I see Graham's got his yeah. hand up. Graham, do you want to ask a question? Uh, G'day, Ben. Hey, uh, Ben, does it handle um, multi-factor authentication as well? Ah, good question. Um, I'd say probably not because you need something on your phone to say yes. Um, so unless there was some sort of Android version of the Power App with the mini gateway on it, I don't know if that will handle that. That's a good question. Yeah. I don't know that it would because it kind of defeats the purpose of multi-factor authentication. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, if you get around it, then it's kind of a bit the MFO is a bit flawed. So I'd say, yeah, until they bring something out on the phone, unless you can do something where you do it by SMS and you're listening, your SMS is like on a virtual SMS number on a website, and you could get the Power Automate to go to the website and do a web call and go, yep, yeah, what's the number, and then put it in. You could do that, but not with a real phone, I don't think. Cool, thanks. No worries. Okay. Any other questions? Probably need to wrap up. <laughs> yeah, cool. All right. No worries, guys. Um, sorry, it's a little bit rushed there. Um, so the next, uh, last one for the year will be, user group for the year will be next month on the 26th of November. Uh, we're looking for any volunteers or ideas for that. So if you want to see more, anything you, that Peter went through today, um, or you want to 
say anything else, they'll just yeah, email us, email us, and we'll try and organize a presentation for you guys. So we be ready to go. Thanks, guys, for your time. I had a good lunch, and uh, we'll see you next month. Thanks, Cheers, everybody. Guys, that was awesome. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Cool. Cheers. Bye bye.